Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by and welcome to our webinar, What's New in Labor Pain Relief, Medical and Non-Medical Options, sponsored by ISIS Parenting and presented by Dr. William Kamen. My name is Chris Just. I'm the Executive Director of Prenatal Education here at ISIS, a certified nurse midwife and your moderator this evening, along with Nancy Holtzman, VP of Clinical Content, Pediatric Nurse, and IBCLC, who will be typing with you in the chat room. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions to the speaker at any time by typing, typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen, or direct them to us on Twitter using our handle at Isis underscore parenting. We'll also take questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded, and all of you will receive a link to the recording by early next week. So if you miss something or need to step away for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to host this evening's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers and online at isisparenting.com. As I mentioned before, I'm Chris Just, and I'll be your moderator tonight. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for this evening. Dr. William Kamen is the Director of Obstetric Anesthesia at the Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston and an Associate Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kamen is an internationally recognized authority on obstetric anesthesia and pain control during childbirth. He has appeared on the Today Show with Katie Couric, the Mehmet Oz Show on Oprah.com, Good Morning America, and has been interviewed in the New York Times, Newsweek, Wall Street Journal, Fit Pregnancy, Pregnancy Magazine, and American Baby. Dr. Kamen is the co-author of Easy Labor, Every Woman's Guide to Choosing Less Pain and More Joy During Childbirth. Easy Labor has won the 2006 Best Pregnancy Childbirth Book of the Year from the National Association of Pregnancy and Parenting Books. Welcome, Dr. Kamen. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, uh, Chris and ISIS Parenting, for having me here this evening. We'll be going through a variety of uh, options for labor pain relief. Uh, this will include a discussion of uh, non-medical options as well as medical options uh, that you see listed on the slide in front of you. And um, we will be going through the slides here. So um, we're going to start with the discussion of uh, some of the non-medical options. And this includes things that you see listed here, such as ambulation. Uh, many people find that getting up and walking around during labor is very helpful. Uh, of course, it may also be that people who find their labors are generally more easy are more likely to be getting up and walking around. Um, but in general, this is a effective technique in early labor. Uh, many of the breathing techniques that uh, have been taught in childbirth classes for decades are actually being phased out, uh, found to be not so effective, the, the heavy breathing, hyperventilation. Uh, you still may see that taught in some breathing classes, but uh, um, it uh, generally is not as effective as some of the other things that we will discuss, uh, such as um, uh, what we see listed on the slide here, mind-body therapies or hypnosis, uh, sometimes known as either hypnobirthing or hypnobabies or mind-body therapy. A whole variety of um, uh, techniques are out there, and this involves uh, uh, some preparation that can be done in your childbirth classes um, uh, with uh, some focused mental imagery and um, sort of changing your mind the way you think about the entire experience. And this, uh, with appropriate preparation, can be very helpful. Immersion in water is becoming extremely popular, uh, either as a shower or a tub. Many labor units have um, uh, facilities to labor in water. Uh, actually giving birth in the water is a different story, but, um, but many units do allow people to get into tubs uh, or certainly showers, and many people find this to be very effective. Uh, birthing balls, like those big things you use at the beach, are uh, uh, effective for encouraging ambulation and getting in the upright position. Uh, and then things such as massage, uh, TENS, which stands for uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, which is a, a very mild but slightly uncomfortable uh, electrical current, which uh, is applied to various parts in the body and can try to change the way the nerves uh, handle the sensations that are going into the spinal cord and the brain. Um, and doulas are uh, labor coaches who can help you with a whole variety of these techniques. 
and uh, many doulas can be um, uh, employed through various local agencies. So we will move on to the next slide. Um, now getting into some of the medical type of uh, pain relief, uh, you have uh, most commonly narcotic injections, uh, typically drugs such as morphine, uh, dilaudid, fentanyl. Uh, these are given by either an intramuscular or an intravenous injection. Uh, they may make both the mom and the baby sleepy, um, especially in larger doses, which is why typically we only give smaller doses during labor. And if people are asking for uh, many additional doses, we will try to switch to something else because very large doses of narcotics can cause these side effects, uh, which include not only sleepiness, but uh, nausea and itching. And large doses given to the baby or given to the mother and then transmitted to the baby can cause some difficulties with feeding uh, and alertness in the baby after birth. Well, nitrous oxide is something which is uh, an interesting medication. It is, um, it's a gas. You breathe it through either a mask or a little mouthpiece. The interesting thing about this is that um, it is used extremely commonly in the, the UK, uh, Canada, Australia, other European countries, but it's almost never used in the United States. Um, uh, there are a few places around the country using it, um, but uh, I'm only aware of a, roughly about a half a dozen hospitals in the United States that use nitrous oxide. Um, and this is an interesting thing for me because it's not really clear why it never became popular in the United States. So it doesn't provide the same kind of effective pain relief that you might get from some of the other medical methods that we'll discuss in a few moments, but it, it does appear to be very safe and with uh, minimal side effects to either mom or the baby. It does cause some degree of drowsiness, but this wears off extremely quickly as the gas is breathed away from the body. Um, there has been some push for some renewed interest in the United States, so over the com coming years, you may see more hospitals that are using nitrous oxide. And um, the, in uh, the, uh, the UK, it's commonly called gas and air, a very common acronym for nitrous oxide. Well, with regard to some of the other medical techniques, the, um, the technique of regional anesthesia is extremely common. Uh, this is uh, also known more commonly as the epidural, which has a few varieties, uh, such as the combined spinal epidural and the patient-controlled epidural, and we will um, uh, we'll talk about those as well. It's called regional anesthesia because a certain region of your body is anesthetized. Uh, you can see in the slide here uh, demonstrating this on a, on a dad that was in one of my uh, uh, childbirth classes here at ISIS Parenting. So um, the, uh, the technique of epidural anesthesia is uh, demonstrated in the next few pictures here where you see um, a variety of nerves that come from the uterus and the nerves go into the spinal column and then that transmits pain impulses back to the brain. And uh, the epidural is just one of a variety of blocks that are used to try to interrupt these pain pathways. So this is a typical demonstration of uh, the patient position. Um, you can't really see the patient too well in this, but basically the woman will be sitting on the edge of the bed, leaning forward, and the anesthesiologist will be standing in back. Uh, they will uh, prep the skin with a, a small amount of antiseptic, which uh, uh, cleans the back in a sterile fashion. Um, then a small injection will be made into the skin of a local anesthetic, uh, usually lidocaine, that will numb a small area of skin. And uh, once that uh, area of skin is anesthetized, a, uh, a needle called an epidural needle is inserted through that anesthetized area of skin into the epidural space, which is a space that uh, surrounds the spinal cord. Uh, it usually, in most people, sits about three to four inches inside the back, uh, but that may vary from person to person. But once that space is accessed, then a small catheter will be inserted. The catheter is a small, flexible plastic tube. It's about the size of a, a piece of spaghetti, uh, very flexible. And once that uh, tube is inserted, the needle is removed, so then the woman has nothing metallic or sharp left inside the back. And the, uh, the catheter then remains in place for the duration of the labor. This just shows about the size of the catheter. It's, uh, again, about the size of a piece of spaghetti. And uh, what will happen is the catheter will be inserted into the lower portion of the back, uh, but then it will be uh, taped up the skin of the middle of the back, right up the spine, and usually that uh, will come across the shoulder, where it will be attached to a pump, and that pump will allow medications to be infused. So the medications are, uh, in most of the epidurals used in the United States, 
The medications are a combination of bupivacaine, which is a local anesthetic, similar to uh, lidocaine or in the same class of medications as novocaine, and fentanyl, which is a narcotic. Uh, the combination of these two drugs is uh, standard and typical for most epidurals that are used around the world. And the reason for the combination is that using each of these drugs together allows the dose of each one to be reduced, and that uh, allows for effective pain relief with a reduction in side effects. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a technique of combined spinal epidural is used where uh, a spinal needle, which is a, a different kind of a needle, goes through the epidural needle, and uh, you can see that a little better on the next slide here, where the uh, uh, spinal needle will be inserted through the epidural needle into the spinal space, which is right over here, and uh, that's this blue column in the middle of the picture here and a small amount of medication is directly injected into the spinal space, uh, which provides very rapid onset of effective pain relief with a very trivial amount of medication. Once that medication is injected, then the catheter, this little curly thing here, is uh, inserted through the epidural needle into the epidural space, which is this yellow space in the middle here, and um, then the needle is removed and the catheter is the only thing remaining in the back. So one of the advantages of the combined spinal epidural is that uh, only a very tiny amount of medication is, um, is needed, and the pain relief is uh, almost immediate. Usually after the injection, by the next contraction, the patient will feel very comfortable, and uh, little or no effect on motor block, or in other words, the, uh, the ability of the muscles to move the legs will not be affected at all. So in most cases, the woman can have uh, full or almost full power to move the legs, uh, to get into different positions, to move around in bed. Uh, for example, if they would like to sit up uh, using a birthing bar, like you see here in this picture, uh, they should be able to uh, fully support themselves but still have the benefit of the anesthetic. The patient-controlled epidural is something which is commonly used. Uh, at my hospital, uh, all of our epidurals are patient-controlled, and this is the growing trend in the United States. Um, um, what, allows, uh, what this allows the patient to do is control exactly how much medication they have. And, uh, of course, every woman is a little bit different. Some require uh, or desire more medication and some desire less. So the patient control technique allows the person to directly decide how much medication they are receiving by pressing a, a button, which is, um, uh, I think you can see this on the next picture here. So the little button is attached to the, uh, to the epidural pump and uh, a very small amount of what's called a background infusion. In other words, the medication is uh, delivered through the epidural catheter in a very small amount. Um, and many people find that that is enough to keep them comfortable during labor. However, uh, for patients that want more, they can press the drug when additional medication is desired, and they can deliver some additional medication. Now, many people are concerned that if they can deliver their own medication that uh, they will be able to overdose themselves with it, but that is not the case because there are safety features built into the pump such that once the patient presses the button, the pump turns off or something called the, the lockout interval, and uh, then for a certain period of time, they cannot get any more medication. So uh, the safety feature uh, allows uh, a great deal of safety without the possibility of overdosing with this technique. And uh, there you just see the picture again of uh, the patient's hand holding the, uh, the button, which is attached to the pump, which is at the side of the bed delivering the medication. So some of the benefits, uh, there, uh, there have been a lot of studies on this patient-controlled epidural anesthesia, abbreviated PCEA, and uh, men, much of the research shows that uh, compared to just regular infusions of medications, when patients are able to control themselves, uh, they use less drug overall throughout labor, uh, less effect on the ability to move the legs. Uh, patients tend to be more satisfied, uh, probably because they have some degree of control over how much medication they're receiving. Uh, and other benefits um, uh, include um, that uh, it's an easy technique, simple technique. Um, it allows the patients to have some degree of control over their own pain relief or some involvement in the entire process. So that's a summary of the regional anesthetic techniques. And uh, the next slide, uh, oh, this shows um, something which is uh, not directly related to what we just talked about, but, uh, but as a common question, uh, people uh, often have tattoos on their back. Uh, some may hear that a tattoo on their back will prevent them from getting an epidural, but uh, that's not the case. 
uh, we see many patients that have uh, very extensive back tattoos, and it is, uh, it is perfectly safe to do epidural anesthesia. So if you have some ink on your back, uh, that's not a problem. You should still be able to receive a regional anesthetic. So moving on, this is, as was mentioned before, my book, Easy Labor, Every Woman's Guide to Choosing Less Pain and More Joy During Childbirth, uh, which covers a lot of these techniques as well as much more. And um, uh, Chris will have a few more words to say here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamen. That was excellent information. I see there were a couple of uh, questions that came up while you were speaking. I know we had some that were submitted before the uh, actual uh, presentation. But um, one question was uh, someone asked if um, you were considering trialing nitrous oxide at your hospital. We uh, have considered that, and uh, it may happen at some point. Um, it's probably not going to be in the, the near future, in other words, not the next couple of weeks or months. Um, there is uh, certain types of equipment that needs to be uh, uh, obtained before we can use this, uh, this gas um, to make sure it's done safely. But, um, uh, but we are considering using this, and uh, all I'd say with regard to that is uh, please stay tuned because uh, we are very interested in providing all of the options that, uh, that are available in other countries, and certainly the safety record of nitrous oxide is, uh, is tremendous. So we do hope at some time in the next uh, year or so to be uh, trialing this at my hospital. Another question is, is it beneficial to still have a doula even if you have an epidural? Uh, well, this is a, a very good question. Um, one of the things that I like to emphasize is that many of the different techniques that we talk about, both medical and non-medical, are compatible with each other. So it's not like you have to pick one to the exclusion of the other. So with regard to this question, for example, having a doula is certainly compatible with having an epidural. In fact, um, I have a term that I use for that called the epidula, um, where you can uh, have the benefit of both. And um, uh, certainly patients that have epidurals are still in need of emotional support, uh, encouragement, reassurance, um, education, and this can be provided very effectively by a doula. So it's a very compatible uh, a combination, and that's a good question. Thank you. We have a couple of questions here about uh, the frequency of spinal headaches. You know, is there any risk involved, and why do some moms suffer and others do not? So the frequency of spinal headaches, um, with regard to the the number uh, is about 1%. Uh, it happens about 1% after spinal, uh, and it can happen after epidural anesthesia as well. So roughly about 1%. So it's, uh, it's not common, but it's not uncommon either. Um, in uh, some cases, it may be related to the size of the needle. So uh, the spinal needle is generally smaller than the epidural needle, which causes less leak of the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and it's really the leak of the spinal fluid which causes the headache. Uh, so the smaller the needle, uh, the less likely you are to have the headache. And uh, all the needles that we use for spinal anesthesia uh, are very, very small these days. And the epidural needle, although that's bigger, uh, actually does not go into the spinal membrane, uh, at least not intentionally. But uh, in roughly about 1% of cases, um, that epidural needle can go through the spinal membrane. Uh, and then in that case, the patient may be more likely to get a spinal headache because it's a larger needle. Um, it's generally uh, uh, not dangerous in the sense that uh, of causing chronic problems, but, uh, but it can be a, a relatively severe headache that may last for a couple of days, uh, although there are very effective treatments for this. Another question is, um, if I had a spinal headache with my first birth, am I more likely to have it with my second? Well, that's an interesting question, um, and uh, it, the answer is not really clear. Uh, there are some people who may anatomically have a certain reason uh, to leak spinal fluid after the needle puncture is made, and in that case, they, uh, they may indeed be more likely to have uh, a headache a second time if they had it the first time. On the other hand, if the headache was as a result of the epidural needle going through the spinal membrane or something that we call a, a wet tap, um, then uh, that may be related to something uh, with regard to the position the patient was in at the time the first epidural was placed, uh, and uh, that may not necessarily be uh, uh, at a greater likelihood of recurring with a second uh, delivery. Um, so if I have an epidural headache or a spinal headache, uh, how is that treated? 
So usually the first type of treatment is just giving some pain-relieving medications, um, uh, various medications like, like Motrin, uh, Naproxen, things like that, um, uh, aspirin, Tylenol. Uh, bed rest seems to help. The, the, the typical symptom of a spinal headache is that it gets worse when you stand up. So uh, staying in bed seems to help. Uh, drinking a lot of fluid and especially caffeinated beverage seems to help as well. The medical treatment for this, uh, uh, which is extremely effective, is called an epidural blood patch. And what that involves is another procedure where a, a needle is put back into the epidural space, some blood is taken out of the patient's arm, injected into the epidural space, and what this blood will do is, uh, is clot and seal the hole where the spinal fluid is leaking. Um, it's a very effective technique, works uh, almost 100% of the time, but it is a bit invasive in that it does involve a, a needle puncture both in the back and the arm to obtain the blood. What if I have, what if I have scoliosis? Will there be an issue with me uh, getting an epidural? Okay, also a very good question because scoliosis is very common. Uh, scoliosis is a small curvature of the back, and in almost all cases, we can still effectively administer the epidural anesthetic. This may involve some slight changes in the angle that the anesthesiologist places the needle, but, uh, but again, in almost all cases, uh, we can effectively provide epidural anesthesia to patients with scoliosis. You know, I understand that skin-to-skin -skin is really important. Can I still do skin-to-skin -skin with my baby if I have an epidural? Oh, sure, absolutely. This is uh, definitely becoming much more common. And uh, there's absolutely no reason why the epidural itself would um, interfere with uh, immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact after delivery. And this is being done both after vaginal deliveries as well as uh, cesarean deliveries. What is your experience with epidurals or spinal slowing and decreasing contractions and interfering with delivery in any way? Well, this is a very controversial question. Uh, we could probably spend the entire hour just talking about this. Um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, related to a lot of concerns about the effect of epidural anesthesia on the labor progress and the outcome of labor. Um, but I'll try to summarize what the research uh, has shown, which is that um, the epidural anesthetic tends to slow the labor to a slight degree. Uh, by slight degree, um, what most of the research studies have shown is that women who have epidurals, on average, uh, their labors are about an hour longer than uh, labors without epidural. But remember, to have an average, you have to have many patients on either side of the average. So in some patients, the, uh, the epidural will actually slow the labor uh, to a great degree, but in other cases, uh, the uh, epidural will be administered and the labor will then dramatically speed up and the patient may be ready to deliver very soon after the administration of the epidural. So there's a wide variation uh, in the, um, uh, the, the length of labor, but when you put everything together on average, it's about one hour longer. With regard to the risk of cesarean delivery, uh, this, uh, although uh, used to be quite a concern, now the research has uh, pretty convincingly showed that epidural anesthesia does not affect the incidence of cesarean delivery. Um, but another type of what we call operative delivery is uh, either forceps or vacuum deliveries. Uh, uh, these are techniques which are used to assist vaginal deliveries. And most of the research shows that uh, the epidural uh, may increase the incidence of the, uh, the need for a, what's called an instrumental vaginal delivery. But this is very variable depending on the preference of the particular obstetrician. Many obstetrical practices are extremely different uh, with regard to their preference for use of forceps and vacuums. Um, I've heard about walking epidurals. Are those, uh, you know, what, 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 are that, what does that mean? Well, walking epidural is a, a little bit of a misnomer in that most hospitals don't allow patients to actually get up and walk around with the epidural. Um, however, most of the modern-day epidural anesthetics are using very low doses of medications such that the ability to move the legs is, um, is not affected. Uh, so even though the hospital, most hospitals don't allow you to get up and actually walk around, you could. Um, or at the very least, even though you're staying in bed, 
you are able to move from side to side to sit up and uh, have some control over the ability to move the lower part of the body, which uh, has some benefits. Some of those benefits include uh, that as you get to the second stage or what's called the pushing stage of labor, you can more effectively be involved in the, the pushing out of the baby, uh, as well as not having the legs being so numb allows for a more of an emotional involvement with the labor process uh, compared to epidurals that were done uh, several decades ago where there really was almost no sensation at all in the lower part of the body. Um, today you really can sort of feel what's going on but yet be comfortable. And Adula is asking that she wants her client to change positions when she has an epidural. Is, is there ever any contraindications to moving? We know that from what you said they can't move outside of the bed, but what about inside the bed? Any contraindications? Uh, well, note the rec uh, contraindications to moving uh, within the bed, uh, but a couple of comments um, is uh, um, as a, a doula, I certainly encourage this uh, this type of involvement with the labor, but uh, but also involve the labor nurse as well. Uh, they can help with the positioning, and uh, and in some cases, um, uh, some labors uh, have babies that. Uh, are a little bit happier on one side than the other. We typically monitor the, the baby's heart rate, and just in some cases, based on the way, for example, the umbilical cord is lying in relation to the baby, uh, the baby may be uh, happier uh, on one side than the other, and the, uh, the labor nurse is usually quite aware of this. So that's why it's important for the doula to be involved with the nurse in assessing the fetal heart rate before changing position. And we have another question. How long does the pain relief from an epidural last? Well, this is also a good question. Um, it typically will, it will last throughout the labor because the medication is infused through the catheter. Uh, once the delivery has occurred, then we turn off the infusion, and generally within two to four hours, the effect of the anesthetic has worn off. Um, however, if you have a cesarean delivery, uh, there's a long-acting type of pain relief. It's a kind of morphine uh, preparation uh, known as uh, Duramorph, and this is added in as part of the epidural uh, or the spinal if you have a spinal anesthetic. And this is a very long-acting pain reliever, which usually keeps people comfortable after cesarean delivery for roughly 18 to 24 hours. Uh, another question here is, um, have you had any experience uh, with sterile water papules? So sterile water papules are small injections of water at the uh, lower portion of the back. And um, there is some evidence that this may provide some degree of pain relief during labor. Um, the suggestion has been made that the pain relief may be better in what are called back labors or where the baby is facing the wrong way, a so-called posterior baby, uh, putting more pressure on the spine. And uh, while this will not provide the type of pain relief uh, that you'll get from an epidural, uh, in some cases um, people find that this provides some degree of um, a sh a short-lived pain relief, usually roughly about half an hour to an hour. And, um, and um, we're certainly using it on occasion in my hospital, and I know others that, um, that are using it as well. So it's, um, it's just something else that, uh, that you may want to ask about uh, with regard to your particular provider. Another question, um, this person says that they had their first child without pain medication and, and in a water tub at a hospital. She says she didn't love the pain, but she did love the water birth. Is there any way to get pain relief and still get to experience a water birth? Well, if the question is can you use an epidural in the water, then the answer is no. Um, that really cannot be combined. Um, um, in some cases, if you've had narcotic injections, you can get into the tub if you're not too sleepy and able to control yourself. So obviously, for safety reasons, you would not want someone who's very sleepy to be in a, a, a water bath. Uh, interestingly, in the United Kingdom and some of the other countries that use nitrous oxide, uh, some people can actually breathe the nitrous oxide while they're in the tub, but as I mentioned earlier, that's uh, only rarely available in the United States. Um, but I think the question was probably directed at uh, specifically epidurals, and, uh, and no, you can't use those um, in the water tub. However, water itself seems to have some pain relief. So people who get in these tubs uh, seem to feel more comfortable, and this may be related to some aspect of flotation or buoyancy where the, uh, the baby and the uterus is supported, uh, floating, so to speak, in the water, and uh, this may affect the way the, the nerve impulses are transmitted into the spinal cord and, um, and may cause some degree of comfort. So many people find that these tubs uh, and or showers are extremely effective during labor. 
Um, and then I don't know if this is something you may have covered in your, your book, Dr. Kamen, but uh, the question here is what are some methods women use to avoid pain meds when they don't have a doula present and the pain is becoming unbearable? Do you find that self-talk and self-motivation work in these cases? Or is it most helpful to receive reassurance and support from another person, for example, your husband, doula, et cetera? Well, there's a variety of techniques um, uh, that were just mentioned, but um, uh, but yes, uh, support from another person is extremely effective. Um, uh, in the absence of a doula, the uh, the labor nurse is uh, is generally very supportive. Uh, interestingly, uh, most husbands uh, seem to be not very supportive, um, and I don't mean emotionally. It's just that uh, they're not birth professionals. Um, so while they certainly may have good intentions, uh, many times the labor nurse. Uh, is one who is an experienced maternity nurse and uh, can help the patient with uh, specific aspects of, uh, of reassurance and focusing, mental imagery uh, related to some of the mind-body techniques that we, uh, that we talked about earlier. Are women who have uh, epidurals more likely to have uh, tears? Uh, it's not really clear about that. Um, the... Um, uh, for one thing, uh, with regard to episiotomies, um, uh, while these used to be routine in many births, um, this has now changed in the United States, uh, so that uh, episiotomies or an intentional cut is really not routine. Um, but um, uh, there is some evidence that, um, uh, that the incidence of uh, spontaneous tears may be, uh, may be slightly increased with epidurals, but, uh, but again, this is largely dependent on, um, on various obstetrical or midwifery practices that go on during labor, uh, things such as perineal massage, uh, as well as the size of the baby, the position the mother is in during labor, the length of labor. So it's very much a confounded or so-called multifactorial uh, problem, which is really difficult to tease out uh, if there's any specific effect uh, of the epidural. What are some specific injected narcotics and how effective do they work? So the injected narcotics, uh, the side effects uh, include um, uh, sleepiness. Um, both in the mother and the baby can show signs of being sleepy based on the fetal heart rate. Um, the mother can also feel some degree of, uh, of nausea. A uh, common side effect from narcotics. Another common side effect is itching. And uh, many people uh, think that if they take a medication and they itch from it, that they're allergic to it. But that's actually not the case with narcotics. Um, uh, itching is just a common side effect of narcotics, and it's not, a, not an allergic reaction. Uh, but it does occur uh, roughly 25 to 50% of the time. Um, and it's usually mild, uh, but in more severe cases, which is not very common, but uh, if it is more severe, the itching can be treated with uh, certain types of antidotes to the itching. And I have a question here. Um, it says, uh, I'm looking for a method to combine with hypnobabies for my second child. Would like something else to be able to call on during the pushing phase this next time. Any recommendations? Um, well, it's um, uh, related to what I mentioned earlier, which is that these techniques are, uh, uh, are all com mostly compatible with each other. So, for example, uh, some women prefer to delay the administration of an epidural until much later in labor, maybe uh, waiting until the, the pushing stage of labor, and certainly using some of these hypnotic or mind-body techniques uh, during the early or middle phases of labor is totally appropriate. And then once you get an epidural later on, sometimes even waiting until the, to the second or so-called pushing phase of labor, you can still use the mind-body hypnotic techniques such as mental imagery, focusing, uh, other things include uh, turning the lights down in the room, uh, having some nice music playing in the background, um, uh, setting the environment uh, to make it more like a, like a homey environment. Um, and these things can certainly be effectively used with an epidural anesthetic. If I have an epidural and suddenly need uh, an emergency C-section, how is the uh, anesthesia adjusted? So what happens in that situation is that the, uh, a different type of local anesthetic, which is stronger than the type of anesthetic that's used for labor, is injected into the epidural, and that causes a stronger degree of pain relief such that uh, the surgical procedure of the cesarean section can be performed. Um, and this is um, uh, it's a very safe technique. These medications are all very safe. As was mentioned earlier, this is a, it's a, a regional anesthetic, which means that just a certain region of your body is anesthetized. 
Um, although with a cesarean section, the region is more extensive than with a, um, a just labor. So to be more specific, usually with labor, the epidural will make you numb from roughly about the belly button uh, on downwards, uh, whereas with a cesarean delivery, uh, the anesthetic will be extended uh, such that roughly around the middle of the chest or the level of the breasts and everything down below uh, that will be uh, anesthetized. Uh, but yes, this uh, can very effectively be, uh, be done with a, a labor epidural uh, converted into a cesarean epidural if that becomes necessary. Um, why are water births so rare? Why are they not practiced in more hospitals? Is it a safety reason? Uh, well, there are some concerns about safety of actually delivering in the water. Uh, I assume the question is just about delivering in the water as opposed to laboring in water. Um, but um, uh, there, there is some concern about safety of this, um, uh, although I can't really speak to the specifics of that right now because it is a bit of a controversial topic. Um, nonetheless, um, uh, there are some hospitals that, that do allow this. It seems to be more commonly allowed in, uh, in birthing center type settings or, or out of hospital births. Um, but uh, another uh, limitation is that not all hospitals have the type of tubs that, uh, that are large enough to allow the actual birth. So for example, you could get in a tub to just sort of float or relax, uh, uh, but it may not have the facilities available to, uh, to actually allow um, uh, the interventions uh, or another person to be involved with, uh, with birthing the baby. Okay, um, I think that uh, I believe that that's it for the, um, the questions. So I would love to um, invite everyone to review the webinar. Uh, let me send you the recording. I know we covered a lot of information tonight. I want to thank Dr. Uh, William Kamen for joining us tonight, uh, and thank you all for asking such excellent questions. Um, and I want to remind everyone that our next webinar is February 11th at 3 p.m. with Dr. Sen entitled Nutrition, Weight, and Pregnancy Research Updates. Be sure to join us then. And in the meantime, have a great night, and thank you once again, Dr. Kamen.